Hey everybody, it's Joe, and I am here with my friend Calvin from Calvin... No, what's your channel called? Make It With Calvin. Make It With Calvin. I knew there was a make. I knew there was Calvin. I just got him in the wrong order. Calvin, it's good to... Good to see you, man. Where Me are too. we today? Where is this? We are in the ghost of the uh, design lounge here at SFSU. I'm showing Joe around the various facilities and stuff, not only for students directly in the design program, but also the makerspace here on campus. Yeah, they've got a cool makerspace. It's got 3D printers and VR. and We're going to go check that out in a little bit. But before we do that, we're going to talk a little bit about, is there really a future for makerspaces? Yeah. Hey everybody, Joe from the editing desk here, and uh, I just wanted to jump in real fast. I'm still unpacking from Maker Fair. It was a fantastic event, and we talk a little bit in this video about the potential ramifications of this being the last Maker Fair. I talk more about this with Barb from Barb Makes Things in the next video. In fact, a lot of the videos that I'm going to be doing in the near future are going to be about other people. Barb and Uni and Calvin from Make It With Calvin. This is going to be a month of shout outs, a month of videos about other people who are making YouTube videos who you ought to check out. So I hope that you will. Now, I'm also gearing up during this this time and this month to be doing the Chibi Malls Kickstarter, which is kind of the sequel to Low Poly Dinos, except that it's completely different from Low Poly Dinos. Yeah, I don't know why this particular project got my imagination, but it has, and I really hope that you'll check it out and find out more about that. In this conversation, I end up talking a lot about something that I actually don't know much about. That is to say, I don't run a commercial makerspace. I do, my day job is I work for a public makerspace, a makerspace that is publicly funded, that is literally a part of a library and so it's funded mostly by grants and budget constraints but it's it's a lot easier but there are still people who are running commercial maker spaces and their voice is not represented in this conversation so uh, despite the fact that i take a stance in this video of kind of being like oh it's doomed i i really don't want that to be the case I, I really want maker spaces and making to be a financially, commercially viable prospect. But with Maker Fair shutting down this year or you know being worried about shutting down because they can't keep the lights on, this this thing that is ostensibly super successful and popular is at risk. That to me seems seems like a dangerous portent. And so what I would like is if you are a part of a commercial makerspace or even better if you're running one and if you have had the opportunity to get introspective about what you're doing please please leave a comment or reach out to me or meet you know talk to me on discord or whatever and and I would like to hear from somebody who's actually in the trenches and trying to make this work about what it takes to make a commercial makerspace successful. Now, I do recognize that one of the rules of business is you don't give away your rules of business. You want, you, you don't want to give power to the competition. But in this case, I feel like this is bigger than a business. This is a movement. And, you know, if, if what you want to tell me is, no, this is a business, and as a business, I can't be giving away my secret sauce, I want to hear that, too. I want to, I want to understand how a business could be successful as a makerspace, how a makerspace could be successful as a business, because I really want to believe that it's possible. So if you're in that position, please let me know in the comments, even if you just have an idea of, of how it could work. I'm, I'm not against commercial maker spaces. I feel like they, they are an important part of the maker economy. That said, my day job is much easier than a commercial maker space. I don't have to worry about those things. So I'd like to hear from the people who do and who specifically who have made it work for some period of time. Now again, in a future video, we'll talk a bit more with Barb from Barb Makes Things about 
her maker space. It's a slightly different situation, but uh, hopefully that'll get you going on. So Calvin, you have a little bit of a different experience than I do when it comes to maker spaces. Definitely. I, I work at a library maker space, which is kind of a public service, and you work... I work in private industry. I work for a small electronics uh, hobby company down in Sunnyvale, and I've also done um, both as a student and as an aide in an adult education program. So I sort of count that as like a private-ish makerspace because there is the paywall to get into there. And if you were, you know, you were allowed to work on personal projects in there as long as they didn't, you know, usurp people doing their actual school projects. Yeah, you were able to do whatever, whatever you within the to. confines of what's allowed in the school system. But not only that, where you live, makerspaces. Uh, do I want to use the word flourish? They they exist. They exist, and they would definitely be a lot more viable than somewhere than a small town. Yeah, for so the private where, where I live, maker spaces would would never work. And be, and I know because we try. But that's not to say that all maker spaces have even worked here. There was no. there was a what was tech, the big one? Tech tech shop tech shop that went down that everybody loved and everybody thought oh it's it's beautiful and it's clean and it looks good and it, it tanked. So the question is, is there really a future for maker spaces or, or are we all fooling ourselves? Are we all living in denial? I mean, I love making. You oh, love yeah. making. Is, is there really a future for maker spaces? Now, I think that the future of maker spaces is in the libraries, is in those public spaces that are made available to people because working at a library our our barrier to entry is much much lower not just for people coming in but also for making the the maker space we don't have any any need to be profitable we don't have any need to make rent every day we're paid for by grants we're paid for by taxes we're paid for yeah. And so we can be a lot more relaxed in, in how we run it and the programs that we offer. We don't have to worry that we're going to be shut down. Whereas a public maker space, if they're not making the bill, if they're not making the rent, they're done for. They're done for. It's a business, and they have to do that. So so now I, I did present this idea to the Bay Area Maker Fair. I said, hey, let me do a talk about maker spaces in, in uh, libraries in the future. And their response was... Considering the people that are going to be in the room listening to you, we probably don't want to share that particular message. You know, it could be it could be taken the wrong way. <laughs> it could be taken the wrong way. It could be taken as me standing up there and saying, "You guys are in the wrong business and you're doing it wrong and you're idiots," which, you know, is not the case. Definitely. I yeah. mean, I'll put it this way: I'm I'm all for public stuff. I can't say how many times the Thousand Oaks Library, back where I grew up, saved my butt with internet before we had internet um, books and resources for both science fair projects and just my own personal curiosity of things so I'm a huge fan of public spaces where people can go and get access to things that normally wouldn't have yeah but on the flip side the drawback to a public space is there's definitely a lot more restrictions about what they can offer what you can do and things like that but that's that's definitely true. Um, working at the libraries, and if you don't mind me interrupting, no, it's all we'll, good. we'll get back to your butt. Um, working at the public library, I have to constantly think about safety because, yeah, we got kids coming in there, and even though I set age limits and I said, okay, you, you can't use the 3D printers unless you're 11 and older. Yeah, we still got four year olds running around and they're coming in with mom and dad. If we had if we had the the equipment that you could have at a public maker space. Forget about it. Oh, yeah. So, uh, what was I talking Oh, hours. I was going to say, um, the other thing about working at a public makerspace like that is is having it open. If, if we have 3D printers, that equipment, we can generally uh, train the, the library staff to use. But the CNC cutter, uh, the laser cutter, we, we don't want that to be run unattended. So, if we don't have somebody there... Who knows what they're doing and how often does the library have somebody who knows what they're doing they have me yeah and so and if i'm not working Joe. exactly if i'm not working that equipment's not going and finding somebody else to staff that has been a pain in the neck so yeah i can see that oh yeah totally i mean 
honestly, my take on it is, you know, the the, pri the public spaces are great for getting people interested in making, and if they really feel like they have a passion, that's where I feel the private ones have their place. Because obviously, once people figure out that they really want to do something, then they can kind of determine from there if they feel like it's worth, you know, investing their money into a membership at a private space to get access to more equipment. Or in the case of, of what we do at the library, buying their own. A lot of people have come in and used the makerspace a lot, and then, because that's who you're competing with. Yeah. Uh, but we'll talk a little bit more about that later, but a lot of people have come in, and I've seen them for weeks and weeks and weeks, and then they disappear. And I'm like, hey, when I see them again, I'm like, what happened? They're like, hey, we were just using your 3D printer so much, we decided to get our own. And that's awesome. Which is awesome, which is absolutely the way it works. So I think I think it's probably time we kick the rest of this guys. Let's talk a little bit more about the professional side. Let's, let's defend that a little bit and then see if we can come up with a conclusion. So if you guys want to see the rest of this discussion, jump over to Make It With Calvin and let's have the rest of this discussion there but thank you guys very much for watching up to this point before we go check out this cool project on the what you making channel on my discord why don't you stop by and check out what other cool projects are there and hey if you share something you've done maybe you'll see it in a future video too Thank you very much for watching. Hey, if I mentioned anything in this video, you'll find a link to it in the cards and you should check that out. Did you know that I'm social? I've got links to all the socials and you should stop by and say hi. I really kind of enjoy it when that happens. Big thanks go out to my direct backers and if you want to know more about how you can become that, there'll be a link right here that you can check out. And as always, I want to remind you safety first because I care about you and I'll see you next time. Oh, that's interesting. Classic one there.